ICANN was launched in April 2007, uh, so we're about 11 years old now, um, and was very much inspired by the campaign to ban landmines and the Cluster Munitions Coalition. So sort of this idea that we need to organize all the organizations working on nuclear weapons, um, and not just in a loose network, but in a, in a focused way as well. People were working on, people have been working on nuclear disarmament since 1945, but in many different ways and with many different kind of aims. Uh, some work on nuclear tests, some work on uh, bilateral negotiations in the US and Russia. It's very focused on um, the US, Russia, the UK, very Western focus as well. Um, and it was sort of like lacked a coherent strategy that everyone could fe feed into in a way. So. First, you know, the first, um, there's always been a treaty, uh, this imagine, imagining a treaty. Uh, but the sort of, the, the idea of banning nuclear weapons, even without the nuclear armed states and the humanitarian initiative, that appeared, that came a bit a few years into the campaign, around 2010. Um, and that happened also not just from ICANN's side. Uh, ICANN was a part of developing that strategy, but also in cooperation with governments and international organizations. Uh, again, very much inspired by the just recently finished negotiations on the Cluster Munitions Convention. Uh, this sort of tight group of organizations and governments and international organizations that had worked to ban weapons before, and they would do that no matter what the US and Russia said, or China. Uh, and I think that that sort of fed into ICANN's model of working. Um, and uh, yeah, the rest is history. Yeah, so in 2010, this came very much from actually the, the ICRC and the Red Cross movement who um, had started looking into what they as emergency responders would do if a nuclear detonation happened. And they did research and came to the conclusion, nothing. We'll pull our people out. Uh, the radioactive um, material is so dangerous to our, our employees that we have a responsibility to protect them. So we would pull them out. We would leave people. You know, they're on their own. And that kind of triggered this uh, idea of the humanitarian consequences. Uh, you had governments like Norway and Switzerland that took up this issue very strongly at the review conference. So you got this reference. And I don't think that the nuclear armed states knew what they were doing. They were very focused on the action plan and these concrete steps watering them down. And then you have this reference that raised concerns about the catastrophic humanitarian consequences. And that really became the launching pad uh, for a whole, the whole movement in a way. Uh, learning lessons from the landmines and cluster managers made the humanitarian the real focus, the, the human suffering. Uh, and uh, we worked very closely in our Norwegian campaign, worked very closely with the government and politicians in Norway, uh, got the prime minister and the foreign minister to agree to host the conference, uh, the humanitarian initiative sort of starting point almost. Uh, and at the same time, there was also this started these joint statements at the UN, you know, 16 governments got together to acknowledge the catastrophic humanitarian concern, uh, consequences, um, saying that any use of nuclear weapons would have this, and under no circumstances should nuclear weapons be used. And this was quite, you know, like a radical, but, you know, a sort of slowly, quite uh, silently changing the narrative. Um, the Norwegian government hosted the first conference in Oslo in 2013, uh, which was really a remarkable conference. It was the first time that you'd even organize something that the P5 didn't support, that you dared to do something. Uh, and just a, a week before, they decided to boycott the meeting. And we were quite nervous in ICANN to sort of uh, how we would respond. Would people be disappointed? Uh, there was someone like, oh, this is all a waste of time if they don't come. How would governments react? Would they would just be there? And we'd never done a conference like that. We didn't even know how it would go. And I remember when the, the moment when I, it clicked for me that the ban treaty was going to work. Because uh, I wasn't convinced in the beginning. I thought, oh, it's an interesting idea. Let's see how it works. But, you know, I, I don't see how it's going to work without the nuclear arms states. But we had the Civil Society Forum, the ICANN Civil Society Forum, on the eve of this big conference. And we had the then State Secretary of Norway, uh, Gry Larsson, this amazing uh, politician in Norway who came. And she talked about, uh, in front of 600 ICANN people in the audience, talked about the, 
the boycott. Uh, well, they've been very angry, the P5. They came and they demarched us and said, you know, this is a distraction. And she just sort of shrugged her shoulders and said, well, you know, their arguments weren't very convincing. And the whole audience laughed. And it was the first time we laughed at the P5. And, you know, I just, it, right there, it just clicked like, oh my God, this is all about changing power dynamics. And this is all about controlling the narrative and we're doing something and they're on the outside. We're laughing at them, thinking that they are the silly ones and we're just, I, I, it, it just really suddenly fell into place for me that how this is going to work. Um, and then, yeah, you know, the conference was a huge success. Uh, nobody cared if they were there or not. Uh, it was really focused on the humanitarian consequences. Uh, Mexico stood up at the end of the conference and said, we're going to host the next conference. Um, and then we were off on this process, in a way. And we were very clear that we wanted to ban nuclear weapons. The governments did not say it that, you know, then. Uh, they really, we knew, we worked with them behind the scenes. We knew they wanted to ban nuclear weapons. We knew they were convinced, many of them. But they didn't dare to say it out loud. Uh, and they wanted to wait for the right moment. Um, and we kept pushing and pushing. Uh, we came in into Nayarit and they also added a conversation about risk and, and sort of trying to increase this sense of urgency. And Austria then announced that they would hold a third conference uh, that then also looked into the legal framework around weapons in general and, and nuclear weapons specifically. And the conclusion was that there was a legal gap. There was no prohibition in place on nuclear weapons and that was a problem and Austria committed their pledge to work to fill the legal gap. Uh, and everyone knew it sort of meant the ban treaty, but it wasn't really clearly outlined. Uh, and, but that sort of got this sort of process and we worked to get con governments to commit to this pledge, um, which then led to the negotiations. Well, we really, I mean, we, we took the, the humanitarian pledge, as we call this Austrian commitment. Uh, and, you know, we pushed very hard that this means we have to negotiate something. This means a new process, a legal process for a new treaty. And I think that the, the first government that ever said publicly that they were prepared to ban nuclear weapons, even without the nuclear arms states on board, was Kenya in the autumn of 2013 after the Oslo conference. And then there was like one or two other countries. Some of them blurred it with the Nuclear Weapons Convention. It wasn't really clear what they meant. But at the Open Ended Working Group, we had pushed and we'd done all the work and we had been reaching out to governments and we had held regional meetings. We'd been talking to parliamentarians and we'd been nagging, nagging, nagging for like three years. And at the Open Ended Working Group, it was almost like you pulled out a plug and the support just came out from everyone. We had this working paper from nuclear weapon free zone regions and they just put in, we need to negotiate a treaty now, we need to negotiate a treaty now. And the support just came tumbling almost. Um, and I think that that's really uh, a sign of how this advocacy work works. Uh, it's no, 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 no. And then it's just yes from everyone suddenly. Uh, and you have that kind of moment where people just change their mind or dare to say what they actually want to say. Um, so you have to be able to stick through the nose uh, in many cases. We've been very frustrated the year before because we, we knew that they wanted to do it, but they just didn't say it. Well, all the decisions around nuclear weapons have traditionally been taken by men. And when I say all, I don't mean every single one. Of course, there are women involved, but the majority of the people around from the kind of civil society side up to you know the military and the prime minister or president side and everything in between uh, very male dominated and not just men but also this kind of masculine um, traits in a way uh, power and forcefulness and taking what you want with force and so i don't believe that women are more peaceful than men inherently but I think that women play certain roles in society. They have certain professions and uh, certain roles in families that means that they have a different perspective. Um, if your main uh, perspective is, you know, feeding people, uh, providing health care to people, education to children, that's your, that's going to be your perspective on, on decision to go to war and use certain types of weapons. How is this going to impact educational system? How is this going to impact food? Um, the provision of food in, in our society and rebuild communities afterwards and healthcare. So you have to have those perspectives uh, in, in the decision making and from 
the lowest level to just activism to the president. I mean, it was really amazing slash stressful and <laughs> nervous. Um, just looking back at all of these moments, you know, in the campaign, um, when you're in them, you don't enjoy them that much, unfortunately. It's just afterwards, you're like, wow, we did that. Um, there was the moment when the text was adopted and we all applauded and people cried and the survivors cried and the president of the negotiations cried and it just, you know, we hugged. That was really, really amazing. But it lasts for, what, two, three minutes? And then it's back to work. And press release needs to go out and we need to tweet. What, what should we tweet about this? And, and you know, just keep going. Uh, and I think that that's the, you need to really love the process. It's not about the victories, it's about the road there. It's very cliche in a way, but it really is. And also the resistance, like you never actually win. Because even when you win, and you get what they said, you can't do this. You can, you're never going to get a treaty, people said. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. You, can, you it's like, give up. And then we got it. And they just shift positions. Well, it's not going to matter. It's insignificant. You're never going to get the, the important states on board. Uh, it's never going to enter into force, they say now. We're going to do that. We know we're going to get it. Um, and then they're just going to say, well, you're never going to go. You never, it's never going to have an impact. You have people saying like that about the Landmines Treaty as well. Like you never get the recognition from the opposition uh, until the sort of uh, maybe hundreds of years later, but never really while you're doing it. So you have to also, um, you have to learn to celebrate uh, and enjoy that, you know, the work goes on. It never finishes. The treaty comprehensively prohibits nuclear weapons. It prohibits using them, uh, developing them, possessing them. Uh, it prohibits stationing them on others' territory. Um, so it's really a, you can't really do anything with nuclear weapons. Um, and you can't assist with those acts either. So you can't help someone else to use them or help someone else to possess them. Uh, but then it also demands that you help survivors uh, of nuclear detonations and help to clean up the environment after detonation. Um, and I think that that's really important language. That this is not just prohibiting countries from doing it. It also requires something from them. And we have a joint responsibility uh, as an international community to address the suffering of people uh, that have been exposed to nuclear weapons. It also has quite uh, progressive language on gender. Mm -hmm. um, both encouraging uh, participation of women in all decision making around nuclear weapons uh, and also recognizes the gendered impact of nuclear weapons. Wim women are much more susceptible to radiation than men are and in particularly girls. The younger you are and if you're female sex the more likely you are to develop cancers and, and different diseases from radiation. So that has to be you know, factored in. Uh, and we know, for example, from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that so many young teenage girls, uh, 10 years after the, the bomb, died in leukemia and cancer and very, uh, very painful deaths and, and, and tragic, uh, long time after the war was over, uh, because they were young girls at the time, or young female babies at the time of the detonation. For about 70 years, uh, we had sort of an in international legal system that accepted that five countries have it. It didn't reject nuclear weapons. It did say that we should work towards disarmament, but it also kind of acknowledged that, well, these countries have them so far and they are kind of important for security for them. And that's just not, a, it's just not good enough for, the, in, for law. Uh, you can't have a, an apartheid law that treats people differently or countries differently. You have to have the same rules for everyone, otherwise it's inconsistent and it's not going to work. So the treaty really kind of revolutionizes it by treating all countries the same. Uh, no one should have nuclear weapons. And, and that's going to put a lot of pressure on the nuclear armed states. Um, if the law says you're wrong, you're doing something wrong, it's going to be much harder for them to stop it. And the nuclear arms states know this. That's why they've opposed it. If, if this treaty was insignificant, if it didn't mean anything, why were they fighting it? Why are they putting resources and time into stopping small Pacific Island countries from joining it? Because they know that every country that joins this is going to chip away at the legitimacy of nuclear weapons. Uh, the terrorists is going to be, it's not going to be as effectful if nobody is impressed and scared and intimidated by nuclear weapons.
uh, Assad doesn't rule the world because he has chemical weapons. The, the ability to impact or uh, the ability to you know kill massive amounts of people and uh, inflict suffering and pain on, on civilians is not a sign of power and prestige. It's what dictators do, it's what uh, human rights violators do, not respectable countries that want to have a good standing in the international community. So it's about shifting the sort of burden of proof in a way. For so long we've been, we're the ones who have to defend our position and say, well, this is why we should disarm, and now it's their turn to be on the outside. They're going to have to justify why, why they want mass weapons of mass destruction, why they think threatening to mass murder civilians or end us all. Collective suicide is a reasonable security strategy. Power. Uh, it's such a power symbol. Uh, it's not a practical weapon. It's not a weapon that has a lot of military utility. It has extremely narrow um, reasons for using them, even, even for the countries that do consider them usable. Uh, it's, it costs a lot of money. It's not like helicopters or ammunition that can be kind of used in, in, in different combat situations. It's basically a, just a big symbol. And I think that's why the treaty is so effective, because you fight symbols with other symbols, in a way. Uh, and a lot of people are always saying that, oh, you know, it's so impossible to get rid of nuclear weapons. I think it could get re be really easy. It's not like landmines that was actually in use and, and the militaries were using them daily. Uh, it's, uh, it's just a symbol and, and in a way it can go away very, very quickly. Uh, I mean, just imagine how quickly the world has changed its mind on other things. Things like gay marriage that was very controversial and unacceptable to many and then very quickly it just changed and now you're completely uh, outdated and you know it, it's bizarre to see politicians you know being against gay marriage for example suddenly uh, or the smoking ban I mean I, I know it's not the same thing as weapons but just imagine that it was completely acceptable to just sit inside here and smoke yeah. and how strange it would be if I took up a cigarette and did that now I mean and that went so fast that went within a year of the law it just you know imagining smoking inside is now what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And I think it can be the same thing with nuclear weapons. Uh, that it's just like, oh my god, remember when we did that? Remember when we had these like, crazy suicide bombs and like, we just thought that it was normal? You know, I don't know really. And, and some days it's really hard to motivate yourself. And I, can, I, I, I think everyone who works on, on heavy issues like this really struggles with like, oh, I'm too tired, can't do it. Why do I have to do it? Why can't I just do something shallow? And you know, but we can all do a little bit. Uh, and in one way, I feel extremely fortunate that I'm also, you know, come from a privileged background and it's an issue that isn't threatening my personal security if I work with it in the way that um, people that work on human rights or on democracy, free speech in, in non-democratic countries, for example, do. Uh, I don't have to put myself at risk to do this work. Uh, so if me who has you know grown up with in a safe country with free education free health care I have you know what I need in life if I can't do this job then who's going to do this job and who's going to be doing these things but I also I mean I'm very passionate about you know people people don't have to devote their entire life to this I don't think we need to put that high bar for people to do something people can just do a little bit I mean my my dream is that people, you know, go on with their lives and then just do a little bit, you know. I like to think of it like the, we demand of our countries that we put 2% of BNP, GDP, to uh, development. And we should all think like that, you know, maybe donate 2% of our salaries. It's not that much, you know, we can, we can manage that. Give 2% of our time, just a little bit. Send an email here and there, sign up for something there, you know, tell well done to the people that do a lot more work. Uh, that would change hugely the, amount, the work that is done. That would impact so many people and, and improve things so much if you just everyone did a little bit. So I think that that's also um, you know, trying to get people to understand that it's not that hard. Uh, you don't have to give up the, the comfortable life either that, that you can maybe enjoy. Uh, you don't have to go full 100% uh, fighting every cause. Uh, you can also pick one out of all the many, many things in life that needs to be worked on. 
Um, but I don't know, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. I, I like winning. Uh -huh. And uh, maybe this is an odd thing to choose then, but uh, I feel like we are winning a lot. Uh, and I think that's really a lot of fun.